So I wanted to share with you guys today how I became passionate about 3D printing. It's just a short story, um, but it puts us back five years to when I was with a mutual friend having a drink, and I met somebody who we were just introduced to at the time. I was having small talk with him, but he was playing with a structure that was something like the structure that you see above you, and it was about an inch, an inch in height, um, quite complex, and he was just fiddling with it as he was talking to me. And I had to stop him. I was very compelled mid-conversation. I said, what is that? And he said, oh, this is, this is a structure that can't be built with standard manufacturing techniques. Um, it was made in a machine that built it really quickly. And that machine is going to cause an industrial revolution. And I said, really? An industrial revolution? When were these machines made? He said, about 20 years ago. And I said, well, why don't we know about them? And so I learned more and more about this industry. And I'd like to share with you today about 3D printing and where we're at in the industry and why I think um, we can't avoid the topics that it's bringing up. So I'm going to show you a few products. This is a light, a pair of high-heeled shoes, a very interesting phone cover, and some fashion clothing, implants, and an engine block. And they all have one thing in common, and that is the way that they were made. And they were all made by a process called 3D printing. And 3D printing borrows the name from a technique that we all know today. I'm sure you all know what this machine is. Most of you will have access to a machine like this, either in your office or at home. I'm sure that there's one in this building. There are certainly hundreds of millions around the world. It is a printer. And with this printer, we feed 2D data of an image um, or a sketch or a photograph. We feed it with ink, and out comes a, an image. So today, we have desktop inkjet printers. Tomorrow, we will have desktop material 3D printers that will take in 3D data and build for us a product on the spot because we'll feed it with material. In this case, the 3D printers built the outer shell of the pen that you see. So how does it work? It reads the 3D data that I told you that's known as CAD data. Some of you might know it. Those of you who don't, it's, it's a data that's uh, generated through professional design programs that are used by professional designers, architects, um, engineers, who model a product digitally in 3D. And we can feed that information to a printer along with material, and layer by layer, we can build that product into a physical part. We say we fabricate it. And within the industry, we call this technique additive manufacturing. You guys will have heard it as 3D printing. And this is how it works. This is an EOS machine. It's a type of 3D printer. We also call it a laser sintering machine. And as you can see, the technique works by taking a cross-section of the 3D product, working from the base upwards, depositing material, and then using a technique to bond the new material to the old material. And as this process just keeps repeating, we see a product building up in the machine ready to use. We can use a variety of materials. We feed the machine with, the, with these materials. And today, they range from a variety of plastics, flexible plastics, multicolored materials. And towards the right, you'll see um, a composite, which is a plastic and aluminum mix. It's called alamide. We can use a variety of metals, such as medical grade titanium, stainless steel, aluminum. The reason I've used this picture here is so that you can see the layering process. We can use ceramics and glasses. And because we're in Switzerland, you can also use material like chocolate. So anything that can be melted down is something that you can build up through this process. 
And these machines can create structures that are very large. This is one of the largest machines. It's called um, a D-shape. And it created this two-meter high structure. And each layer thickness is about five millimeters. And on the other end of the spectrum, this is an EOS micro-sintering machine. That, well, these parts came out of an EOS micro-sintering machine. And the layer thickness is about four microns. So our detail today is, is quite extraordinary. And the quality is becoming more and more impressive. So who uses these machines? The obvious advantage is they're very rapid. They've been around for 20 or so years. And today, the, the quality is good enough for final end parts. But traditionally, we've seen them being used by product designers for prototypes. These are prototypes of a mouse made by Microsoft. Um, we can have a flexible design process where designers can iterate their design before it reaches the market and very quickly build that product in a number of hours in a machine instead of incurring high injection molding costs. But today we're seeing these machines make final products, not just prototypes. This is a lamp created by Beth Shaber Grossman. You can see the complexity of the design with the intertwining structures is something that can't be built today in any other way. And in fact, we can use 3D printing to make structures within structures, movable components, um, things that make us wonder what's going to happen with manual labor if a machine can do these kind of things. It's been used in furniture. So these chairs were designed by a company called Freedom of Creation. And a super yacht owner loved them so much that he ordered 18 for his yacht. Through to fashion, this is some clothing that was made by Materialize MGX. And again, when you look at the complexity of these designs, it's very extraordinary. We can't make this in any other way. It's almost like we can do away with some levels of craftsmanship because we can't reach the kind of detail that we can with 3D printing. And moving away from consumer products, the applications of, of exploiting this complexity move towards uh, automotive. So this is an engine block. This is a standard engine block that you see today um, in, in vehicles. It's a solid block, and it's got some cooling channels running through it. But the problem is it's very heavy. Um, and we all know in, in sort of automotive industries, for example, Formula One, it's key to try and get the weight of this product down to enhance performance of the car. So if we remove from the design the solid part, just focus on the cooling channels, and we can use a bit of software today from a company called Within Technologies, uh, which is our sister company, to create a system that starts rebuilding the structures only where necessary to hold the, the weight that's needed. And by the end of the process, we're left with a design, again, that's not buildable in any other way because it's so complex and it's made in one piece. But now you can see there's less material waste and the cooling channels can now work more effectively because they're exposed to um, the surrounding space. And of course, this is a lighter part, so it's more e efficient. And moving into medical, another application is implants using the complex structures to create more porous implants, which is key to the purpose of implants. So those of you who are in the medical profession will know that if there's more solid material in an implant, body tissue tends to move away, and therefore there's a rejection of the implant. Well, here, these cavities um, that can be created mean there's more space in the part for tissue to grow into. Um, and these are some implants that came out of an EOS laser sintering machine. There are about 150 made in one go over a number of hours. These all happen to be the same. But what's interesting to know is that 3D printing has no economies of scale. So each one can be different, and each one can be specific to a patient, which moves us into the idea of bespoke products. And as the world moves in, 
to, towards the direction of individuals wanting products that are made for their specific needs. We all know that in the consumer marketplace. There are many companies now, actually most companies on the high street, that have customizable products that are offered to their consumers. And, and individuals want to express themselves through design and engage in a design process. Well, 3D printing now allows that, and we can create runs of one. So the website of the future is going to look something like this, where you can go online and you can select the product. In this case, it's a lamp that you want to design. Now, this is a software that my company created. It's, it's on a closed demo site called Ucodo. This was created by a professional product designer. He's created the lamp, and then he's created a customization experience with parameters in 3D space in which um, a user who has no design expertise can now iterate the design for their needs, for their own preference. The next just generation of customization, unique individualized parts. And software like this is breaking down the barrier for um, 3D printing to reach the public arena. Because typically, if you gave a 3D printer to the general public, they'd say, what would I do with it? I don't, I don't have sort of a Microsoft Word or Excel equivalent for a 2D printer where I can create my templates. And this, will just, this, this software just churns out the file formats necessary for an individual who doesn't know how to create the right files. And through the web, this can be sent to local manufacturing centers and built on demand. So we're talking about positive cash flow. There's no need for companies using this technique to, to have warehouses. We are manufacturing on demand and locally. Therefore, we're reducing down shipping costs. There's a lower carbon footprint. Great benefits. This is actually one of the lamps that came out through this design process that got printed. And here you can see a few uh, different variations. So they're really beautiful, and they're made in one piece. Here again, a whole variety of design products. So this is my team. I thought I'd just show you what we got up to in the office. Um, quite early on when we started the business, we all decided that we wanted to make our own products. And we were in the office, and we thought we'd make some kitchenware. So Asa, our creative director, fancied making some lemon squeezes, and he created a customization experience through the software that allowed for the iterations that you see on the left. This is our technical director, Sia. He said he wanted visors. So this is what came out of the machine. And I made an egg cup, because I have eggs every day for breakfast. And this is what came out of the 3D printer. So you can make an abundance of products from the more complicated, high-level engineering uh, designs all the way through to things that you have on your desktop today. And there are remarkable benefits with 3D printing. But there are questions as to you know, where is the world going to go with this technology? We can manufacture things on demand, but does that mean that we're going to create things and dispose of them quicker? This begs the question on sustainability. And through this, we'll see the world move towards a direction where you can download parts from the web, spare parts, if you're missing a product. And that's great um, if, for example, your Hoover breaks down or your washing machine breaks down. And that model's discontinued, you can find the spare part that will fit just by downloading the data and building it at home. So we don't need to have runs of millions of products sitting in a warehouse. But at the same time, what happens with copyrights? If we can download product data today like we download music, then we're likely to see that the product industry might be disrupted just like the music industry. And just finally, to talk about its effects on businesses. This is a bike. About 60% of it was made with a 3D printer machine, a metal sintering machine. And in a, a, a bike factory, 
there will be a whole host, tens of different machines that will de make different elements of this bike. Now imagine going to a company and saying, you know, great supply chain, but actually your 10 different machines and your hundreds of millions of pounds worth of machinery can actually be put aside and you can do um, all of these different elements with one machine. What's for sure is the world is changing. This is a technology that we can't avoid. Um, and it is going to change the landscape of manufacturing. So we cannot turn our back on it. But I think that we'll see some remarkable things to come. And I think that the world is changing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Stay, stay there. We had a lot of questions. Um, I just wanted first. Some, somebody had one of your products, yeah. and they gave it to me. I don't know if we can zoom, but so these shapes are basically impossible to do with traditional molding. Is that the right word? They're not impossible, but what's interesting about the things that you have in your hand is they're made in one piece. What you'd usually have is the cartridge holder inserted and certain elements assembled. Th this one inside, there is some emptiness that wouldn't really be possible. It, would be, it would be very difficult technique. to make. I hope the camera caught these. This is pretty amazing. Um, what, what's the price for this product, say this, la this lamp that you showed us and that people could design? What is the price? Um, well, there are some, some sites out there where you can buy products today, so such as Shapeways or iMaterialize, and, and a lamp can cost anywhere from $40 to $50, I believe. And how long would that process take? I mean, the, the printing, so I'm ordering, I'm going to the website, I'm ordering a lamp. How long until it ships? I'm not sure about the, the consumer models that are out there today, but I think you can get them within a week or two weeks. But in fact, that's more to do with the logistics than it is the process. Mm. With the process, you can build these products in hours. In the news a couple of days ago were um, some implants being printed. Uh, so it's not only design, it's not only furniture, it's some like real uh, serious stuff. Can you tell us a bit about that, like the usage of 3D printing in the medical uh, Domain. Sure. Um, I think why 3D printing is starting to hit the public more today is because there have been years of, of research and development by medical companies, for example, that have been testing implants. And today, using um, medical grade titanium, the actual process for 3D printing medical parts is approved. And obviously, now we're seeing implants that are, that are better than those that were around before, now available. 3D printing is limited in the sense that there are only a few materials that the object can be made of. Um, everybody's like some of the fantasies that one day you can just like photocopy an object. You know, basically you put an iPod uh, in one machine and then an iPod comes out of another machine. And obviously a lot of people are losing a bit of uh, getting a few white hairs over <laughs> that happening. Uh, is that possible? It's not yet possible. So you're but all you safe if you have a consumer business. So how big the yet is? Um, at the moment, we can only build out of one type of material, but we can build in multiple colors. Um, so what we'll see is that you can assemble parts that are 3D printed. But I don't know if you'll be able to um, create your iPod for another, something that complex. For another 50 years. Okay. I mean, I can't see it in the foreseeable future. Thank you very much. Lisa Haruni, ladies thank and you. gentlemen, thank you. Mm -hmm.